Matthew chapter number 27 this morning. Last week we preached on the uh, person of Judas and we kind of started a look at uh, the cross of Christ and various uh, different people that you meet on the Calvary Road. And of course, it starts, the Calvary Road really starts in the garden with the uh, betrayal of Jesus and the capture of Jesus. And I want to try to continue on uh, in that uh, strain of thought. Now, next week we'll be preaching something more pertinent to the holiday, but uh, I do want to kind of walk through some of these messages with you. This one today is concerning a man that most people really don't know much about. I remember growing up as a lost religionist in the Catholic uh, organization, and we would quote, you know, the Apostles' Creed and all these different things, and, you know, a lot of vain prayers. One of the things that we constantly recited was that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. When I punch his pilot, sounds like a boxing match. I don't know. Sounds like a pilot that, you know, an air, air, airline pilot that fought Mike Tyson. I don't know. But I did, that's, that's literally, I knew zero about it. I mean, I, I really didn't know who this guy was. And uh, I think it's important that we take a deeper look at him because a lot of times in the Bible he's mentioned, passed over, and you don't really think much about him. So we're going to focus today on some of the events surrounding him and concerning the cross of Calvary. And let me remind you today that Jesus' cross uh, was not just so that we could get to heaven, but Jesus' cross, uh, Jesus died on the cross because we were sinners and uh, we were going to go to a devil's hell and uh, there was no other way for us to get to heaven, to be forgiven, to be in the presence of God. And so uh, Christ came and died on the cross to deal with our sin. He took your sin and my sin in his own body on the tree and became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And uh, so I want to uh, just invite you today, if you have never trusted Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, that today you would do that, that you would make that decision. You would hear the facts of the gospel, how that Christ died for us, was buried, and then rose again. And you'd be willing to put your complete faith and trust in him, repenting of your sin, and asking Christ to be your Savior and Lord. So I want you to consider that today. We will have an invitation at the end of this message. And I want you to respond if the Lord so leads you to this day. Uh, Matthew chapter number 27. And we're going to just read verse number 1 and 2. And then we're going to have a word of prayer. But I want to preach today on the subject of Pontius Pilate lost in the valley of decision. Amen. Lost in the valley of decision. Matthew 27 verse number 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him... They led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We ask you, Lord, today to work in our hearts. We ask you, Father, to speak to every person. Lord, I pray that the message of the cross would go forth and that, Father, each one would see the importance of putting their faith and trust completely in Jesus Christ. For those of us that are saved, may we learn more, not just about our Savior, but about his trial, about all that he went through, all that he endured, even on his way to the cross. Father, beginning at the garden and walking the Calvary Road, for which he never shied away from, never quit, never stopped, but he went all the way up the hill to lay his life down for us. May our hearts rejoice today as we examine and are reminded what Christ did for us. Now, I pray your Holy Spirit will get in this today. Work in every heart, and Lord, draw the lost unto yourself. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Now, Pontius Pilate, as we're going to get into this, was just briefly mentioned. He was the one that consented to or authorized or allowed the Savior to be put to death on the cruel cross of Calvary. Uh, there on the cross, Christ bore our sin. Uh, he paid our debt to God the Father so that we could be saved by the grace of God. Now, that became effectual in my life. In other words, that was appropriated to my life or his payment was applied to my personal account in 1987 in Fort Benning, Georgia, when I ran up the white flag of surrender just before my 18th birthday and uh, called out to God and asked him to save me. What happened 2,000 years ago was still alive and well in 1987 and uh, I received Christ as my savior. And so just because Jesus did this, doesn't mean, hey, great, now we're all going to heaven. Amen. What it means is 
God has given you now an offer that you can be saved, but you must come to him that you might have life. Amen. amen. And I did that. I'm so glad if you did that today, say amen. amen. Now, if you've ever been amen. saved by the grace of God. Now, if you've not, uh, we're not mad at you today. In fact, we preach these things. We assemble. We have this building and do everything that we do for this time that people who do not know the Lord might come to him that they might be saved by the grace of God. Now, concerning Pilate, uh, this man that consented to the death of Jesus, it is my sincere belief biblically that Pilate should have become a Christian or certainly could have become a Christian uh, if there ever was one that could have been saved by the grace of God and certainly in my mind should have been, it would have been Pontius Pilate. You say, why is that? Well, because Jesus Christ was innocent. He was a miracle working man, but he had done nothing uh, whereof they accused him of doing that. And so Pilate knew that. He knew of the innocence of Jesus Christ. And in fact, he had witnessed, officially witnessed and declared the impeccable innocence of Jesus Christ on more than one occasion. So them saying that he says he's God, but he's not. Pilate knew contrary to that. Them saying he said this and did this. Pilate had declared him innocent, literally saying, I find no fault in this man. And so the fact, uh, in fact, rather, the innocence of Christ was established before Pilate, but not just Pilate. His innocence was established before various authorities after Christ's arrest in the garden. In fact, think about it. Uh, of all these intense interrogations throughout the entire investigation into the allegations against Jesus, no one had concrete evidence. I mean, there was ample time. There were certainly a lot of accusers that were there. Many of these were doctors and learned men. And, uh, but no one had concrete evidence that he had broken any laws of God uh, that made him worthy of death or, in fact, that made him worthy of any punishment whatsoever. And so they examined him thoroughly. And yet Jesus was found to have been innocent. Now, from man's perspective and my perspective, it's a sham trial. Amen. Right. And yet in God's sovereignty, God had allowed for this all to take place because he knew that the only payment he would accept is his son's precious, perfect blood, a perfect sacrifice right. so that you and I could be saved by the grace of God. So while we look at the difficulties of the Calvary Road, we look at the punishment, the anguish, the physical pain, the embarrassment and all of that. Remember that it pleased the Father to bruise him because the Father knew this was the only remedy. And as hard as it was going to be for Jesus to go through this, the end result would be that he would offer salvation uh, from sin to the whole world, to anyone who would come to him. Now we'll remind you that after the garden, Christ stood before several different groups. First we find, as we looked last week at his betrayal there in the garden from Judas, he first stood before what we'll just simply call the multitude. Now in the multitudes, a variety of different subgroups, we could look at the scribes, the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the elders. I don't know if there are any of the, quote, zealots in there. That was another biblical group at that time that wanted the overthrow of Rome and really didn't care about much else. But we know certainly that the multitude was a variety of different groupings of people with a variety of different belief systems. Matthew chapter 26, verse 55, you don't have to turn there, but it says that this there, in that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are you commanders against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you uh, teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. And so first he's going to stand before the multitude and his first charge is that of hypocrisy. Notice what he said. I was in the temple. He didn't say anything. Now you're going to come like a bunch of sneaks. Amen. And I'll tell you what. They may have been emboldened because of all, all, how many people were there, but they were still pretty wimpy. Amen. Because he didn't dare take Jesus there in front of everyone, but they came by night to take him. Right. Then Christ, after the multitude, he stood before a man by the name of Annas. Now Annas, with the chief priests, elders, and scribes, uh, he's also going to examine Jesus Christ. In John chapter 18, verse 12 through 13, it says this, Then the band and the captain of officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest, that Savior. Now, the Bible is pretty self-explanatory there, but let me just put it in layman's terms who Annas actually was. He was a former Jewish high priest, the office of the high priest now filled by his son-in-law, Caiaphas. 
But say, why did they take Jesus before Annas then if he was the former high priest? Because in the Jewish economy and customs, if you were still a living high priest but weren't the acting high priest, you were like the father, the godfather, amen? You were the guy that was the guru that everybody looked up to, even more so than the high priest in many cases. And being the father-in-law of the current high priest, they took Jesus to him. Now, he still wielded great authority, by the way. He had a great degree of authority, and therefore Christ was taken to him again. Again, I liken him like to the high priest emeritus, amen? Still in a very honorable position, just not operating the daily uh, functions of the high priest. Now, it was uh, Annas, by the way, that presided over the Sanhedrin council later when Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin council. That was actually Annas that was the president of that. Uh, after Annas interrogated Jesus... Jesus then stood before Caiaphas. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us much about any evidence brought by those first two groups, and that's why we're not mentioning any, amen? So we're going to get to all of the accusations, and then we're going to find out that none of them really held water. So after Annas interrogated Jesus, he's then going to stand before Caiaphas, the acting high priest and the son-in-law. So the Bible said in John 18, 24, now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. It was in front of uh, Annas' son-in-law, Caiaphas, the acting high priest, that Christ was stricken in the face. In case you wonder where that was at. By the way, I believe a lot of things could have happened potentially there in Pilate's Hall. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, John 18 and verse number 22, the Bible said, When he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of the hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Now Caiaphas advised that Jesus should be put to death. Now think of this. He wants Jesus to be put to death and really has no evidence of any wrongdoing whatsoever. Now I'm just going to tell you, there is a hatred in this world against the Savior. There is no rhyme or reason to it other than you must understand we're in a spiritual battle. You must understand there's a spirit world out there. There's the devil and his fallen angels and there's the Holy Spirit of God and the angels of God and there is a constant war going on. You don't have to say anything bad. You don't have to do anything bad towards somebody. Just let it be known that you're a follower of Jesus and you are going to have to pay a price. And there is a vitriol and a hatred towards Christians and our Savior uh, in this world that doesn't make any sense. Why would Caiaphas do this with no evidence? Well, think of it. He advised that Jesus should be put to death, but he wasn't able to put him to death. Now, have the Jews not been under Roman rule and under a Roman occupation? This crime of blasphemy, theoretically, they're just in Judaism or in, in, in Jerusalem for that matter, could have been punished by the authority of the Sanhedrin, which was the uh, uh, the religious uh, you know, body that was in control. But they had to appeal to the Roman authority, Pilate, to sanction this action. So they sent him to Pilate. They're going to persuade him now to carry out their sentence. Now, make no mistake, Jesus Christ was no blasphemer for claiming to be God. You say, why is that? Because he is God. Let me say that again for those in the back. Amen, Brother Zach right there. Amen. He is God. Jesus Christ is 100% God. And when he was here on this earth, he was 100% a man in the flesh. Not 50-50. He never laid aside his deity to the point where he was no longer God. He is eternal, 100% God, just as much as the Holy Spirit and the Father. Amen. Uh, so now uh, Jesus finally stands before the subject of our message, and that is this man named Pontius Pilate. Pilate is the surname of the Roman governor of Judea that ultimately delivered Jesus to the Jews to be crucified. Now, I'd like you to take your Bible with me now and go to Luke chapter number 23 with me. We're going to start picking this up in Luke chapter number 23. Jesus now is going to go before Pontius Pilate. And I want to start in verse number 1. I'm going to read about seven, seven or eight verses here. I want you to notice so far, there's no accusation with any kind of evidence whatsoever. Luke chapter 23, verse number 1. By the way, you say, well, how could these people do this to him and, and want to kill him with no evidence? That's what the Bible calls such contradiction of sinners against himself. Amen? Amen. Consider him that endured such contradiction. 
Well, I've done nothing wrong, and they just make up lies about him. Amen. And so, we're, and by the way, we're considered that he went through that, lest we be weary and faint in our own minds. So, what you're seeing right here, you need to consider what Jesus did for you. He endured the betrayal of his own people he came to save. He endured the lies, the contradictions, and all the other physical punishments and shames on the Calvary Road. Luke chapter 23, verse 1 The whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the King. Now, let me tell you, if, if they went to speak and all of a sudden, like the honesty bug bit them, this is what they would have said. This guy's preaching, and he's got bigger crowds than us, and we're sick of it. Man. This guy, we're not making money. Our offerings have gone down because there's nobody here to give offerings anymore. Did you know that people are following him and they're throwing off the religion of our fathers? Man. And in pride and defense of our dead father, that's literally what they ought to have been saying. Or we just have wicked hearts and we don't like this guy because we will not submit under his authority. Amen? Right. And so, but they didn't, the, the honesty bug did not bite them. And so they lie about him. We found a pervert in the nation. He came to save the nation. Amen. So we know this is just a pack of lies. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. And I think that's interesting. Amen. That's like when somebody comes to me and they start talking about something as if I said something to them. And it's a spiritual matter. And it's like, I didn't say anything. You're the only one saying that. Sounds like the Holy Spirit must be the one talking to you. Amen. Amen. And so this is interesting to me. And I do believe that Pilate was being troubled and drawn by the Father. Uh, the Father wanted to save all of them. Amen. Notice Amen. this. Pilate said to the chief priest of the people. Well, notice he answered him and said, Thou sayest in verse 4. Then said Pilate to the chief priest of the people, I find what? No fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Now, this is interesting. He says, I find no fault in him. So now they're really going to double down and give him some evidence. And you know what the evidence is? Well, you know, he's preaching all over the place, and we just can't have this. That is not evidence. It certainly does not denote a crime at all. But when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was also at Jerusalem at that time. So Pilate declared him innocent, but he just wanted Jesus out of his hair. Amen. He thought this. Why make a decision today? May I just stop and try to make a, an application? Many people today, when confronted with the question of Jesus, say something similar to that. Not now. I'll just deal with it later. Why make a decision about Jesus today? Can I not just kick the can down the road a little bit and deal with this a little bit later? And as I've made a statement, I'm sure that it rolls in one ear and out the other of some people, and it just seems cliche, and, but I've seen it to be true. I've evidenced it, and that is that many people that say they're just going to get saved at the midnight hour, they die at 1145, and they're thrust into flames of hell, and there's not another chance for them to be saved by the grace of God. So Pilate is gambling. He's He's rolling the dice. He's risking his eternity, but he just doesn't want to deal with it now. And I would just ask the question for you to think about, if you're a child of God, are you like me? Some of you put off Jesus for a while. You thought, well, I'll deal with it later. I'm thinking this is probably true, but you know, I love my sin also. I was like that. My brother started telling me I was going to hell in a handbasket when I was 15. Came to me, and my brother didn't understand tact. He just attacked, amen? Went to Revelation chapter 20, showed me I was going to the lake of fire, and said, Ted, you're going to burn in hell forever. He Again, he just laid it right out there. But for three years, I still love my sin. But after a little while, I start thinking, he's probably right. He's got to change life. Nobody could have done that but God. I have a lot of evidence for Jesus. And I want you to understand that God now is working here in Pilate's heart, but he just isn't ready to give in yet. And I pray that if God has been working in your heart, if you see that you need to, by faith, accept Jesus as your Savior, that you'll stop kicking the can down the road. You know what amazes me is somebody's like 95 years old. Well, yeah, I'm thinking about it. It's like, man, you might not have another five minutes. 
you've got one foot in hell and the other on a banana peel, and you're on life support in the hospital, and you'll get back to me. Look, there is an urgency to being saved by the grace of God, and the reason is because a heart attack will take somebody out in a second. A brain aneurysm, a stroke, make them you know, incapacitated to the point where they cannot respond to the gospel. And so please, don't kick the can down the road. I'm going to tell you this, I wish I would have gave my life to Jesus when I was younger, but I bless God that I did yeah. not waste as many years as I could have, that I gave right. him the strength of some of my youth, and I've committed my life to him uh, so that I did, because you're going to look back someday, and the only regret you'll have is, man, I wish I'd have got saved earlier. Man, I wish I'd have gave Jesus more. I wish I'd have known him and been able to have the you know, Christian principles governing my life and my home to know the will of God and to walk the path that God designed for me from heaven itself. And so no, no doubt some of us were like Pilate. We have put Jesus off some as well. But next now, Jesus is going to be examined for the fourth time. Still no evidence. You get, are you getting this? Okay, this is his sham interrogation and investigation into his life. So, uh, but now he's not going to be examined in the jurisdictional area he was captured in, but rather the one that he hails from. Christ now stands before a man named Herod. If you were here for the entirety of our Israel study, I showed many, many different uh, Sunday night slideshows. We showed you Herod's palace, and uh, we showed you a, a lot of things about Herod, several different palaces, by the way, and uh, some different places that Herod was, and Herod lived, and all of that. So Herod, he was the tetrarch, or the Roman ruler of Galilee. This is the same man. Yeah, he was a very moral guy. He stole his brother's wife. He then puts John in the dungeon, and because of a vow to a vile harlot, uh, he cuts the Baptist's head off. So this is the guy that Jesus is now going to stand before. Get this, he's a Baptist killer. Amen, we know that. We know there's a very immoral, evil, wicked man. And now our Savior is going to stand before him. Uh-oh, Jesus has to stand before a Baptist killer. Well, let me just say this. Jesus wasn't inviting his fingernails. He wasn't worried about this at all. Everything was under the sovereign control of the Heavenly Father. And Jesus Christ was not the least bit intimidated by this mighty, powerful man named Herod who had the power to take his head off in one second. Uh, notice, if you would, Luke chapter 13 with me. If you'll go there quickly, Luke chapter 13. Let me show you how Jesus felt about this guy, Herod. By the way, let me just say this. I get there's a thing called pride and cockiness and arrogancy, but I am not going to tremble before this evil world. I'm not. I'm not bound down to them. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to give in. I didn't come this far just to compromise my principles and then be something that I'm really not on the inside. I mean, honestly, uh, I see people compromise, and I get any one of us could, but I'm not even sure how you get to where you start compromising like some of the people today. They've lived for Jesus, supposedly, then all of a sudden their church now turns into an LGBT church. It's like, well, you just threw everything away that you ever preached. Well, I could give you a ton of examples of the big namers uh, on the television set and on the radio that you hear and see. A lot of those people have compromised their principles. But listen, uh, Jesus is not going to fear governmental leaders. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I fear what they could do to some people. I know how they could hurt some people. But I don't fear governmental leaders. Notice, Amen. if you would, he, cried, he stands before Herod. And uh, notice Luke chapter 13, how he felt about Herod. Luke 13, verse number 31. The Bible said, In the same day there came certain the Pharisees, saying uh, unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. You know what that was? That was an idle threat. I'm sure they were like, looking mean, you know. I mean, they're probably flinging snot. I mean, they're probably frothing at the mouth. And they were just really trying to intimidate Jesus. And I love the calmness with which he responds. Because he was living for different purposes. He was from a different place. And he had a different mentality. And it just shows how far superior uh, the Lord is in this. But notice this. The Bible said, And he said unto them, in verse number 32, Go ye and tell that fox. Got a message for the fox. Amen? Behold. He said, I cast out devils. He said, Tell them I'm here. Tell them I'm casting out devils. No, you better run for your life. No, see, I'm here doing the will of the Father. 
And I'm just going to keep on doing the works the Father had sent me to do. By the way, let me just say, if you are doing the works of the Father, Amen. don't let anybody intimidate you. Amen? Amen? It's interesting. I was over at the Publix and met the Publix manager recently because we were over there passing out tracks and everything. Now listen, as a Christian, I will honor their rules and I will honor the fact that that is their physical property because we have property rights and I also want to obey the laws of the land. But when they come to a public place or a public sidewalk and say you ought not do this or you shouldn't do this, I am going to do it if I go away in handcuffs. Amen? And I'm going to preach to those in the jail and witness to the cops in the car. I'm just saying, folks, uh, we ought to obey God rather than men. And Jesus is just nonchalantly saying, here I am. And I have every right to do this. I'm on a mission from the Father. Go and tell that fox. And by the way, I uh, got to got to befriend the guy there uh, from Publix. Praise God, inviting the church. Amen. And so that all went fine. But uh, notice what he said. Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today. And he said, If you can't get here today, I'm here tomorrow. And the third day, I shall be perfected. He says, I am not going anywhere. Verse 33, nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Uh, now, uh, this is interesting to me. He said that fox can't hurt me till I'm ready to die. So when Herod does what he does, Christ is sent away uncondemned and declared innocent. Look, if you would, to Luke chapter 23 again. Now I want you to see here, Luke chapter 23, verse number 8. Luke chapter 23, verse number 8. By the way, you may come across somebody sometime that says, well, Jesus did sin. Jesus did break the law. Hope this message rings in your brain as you read these scriptures with me and hear them. Notice verse 8, Luke 23. The Bible said, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Now let me just say, you can look at that and say, oh, he was just worried about miracles like you wouldn't have been. Amen. Like you hear this guy walks on water, multiplies bread, and takes lepers, and all of a sudden leprosy is gone. I mean, yeah, you don't want to see him as well. Amen. But he was carnally minded. He had no, it's just a black heart, no light shining, and he needed to be saved by the grace of God. Come from a pagan Roman culture. Verse number nine, and he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. The same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves, and Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said to them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people, and behold, I having examined him before you have found no fault in this man, Touching those things whereof you accuse him. No, nor yet Herod. For I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. What did he say? All the governmental leaders have checked him out. You're wasting our time. This guy's innocent. Let's just release him. Amen? And so now Christ finally gets kicked back to Pilate for the fifth interrogation, okay? So don't ever let somebody tell you, well, you know, they should have investigated further because Jesus had a lot of sin. No, this is a pretty thorough investigation. Uh, he asked him in many words and tried his best to get information. Certainly, the Pharisees and Sadducees at every point were interjecting their lies and their garbage and their false accusations. So now he's gonna go to Pilate. This is number five, right? Interestingly, Pilate, or Pontius rather, means bridge or fifth. I thought that was interesting how that correlated with the fifth stop on his interrogation. And he was in charge here, uh, Pilate was, uh, of the fifth examination of Christ and now his personal second examination. Now Pilate has a huge decision to make. What will he do with Jesus of Nazareth? He's kicked back to Pilate. Pilate's done kicked him down the road and all of a sudden the wind blew him back. Amen. There's nowhere he can go now. Nowhere to kick him. Nowhere to turn. It's his jurisdiction. He must now make the decision. And the question that he is being asked is this. What am I going to do with this guy, Jesus of Nazareth? Now, it's interesting because when that thought came to my mind, it rang in my heart because this is what literally the same question every man, every woman, every boy, every girl uh, is, that has ever lived is facing. What will you do 
with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is the real decision that you're going to have to face someday. And the Father's not interested in your hair color, how big your house was, or how religious you were. The question is asked in, at the eternal throne of God is, did you accept my son? What did you do with my son? And when the books are open, the answer is there, and the reply will be either that you are uh, saved or you are lost. If your name's not in the book of life, you're cast into the lake of fire. Now, as Pilate pondered this question, there were two influences pulling him in two different directions. That's where every person today is. The world is yanking at them saying, they're weird. That stuff's crazy. You go to the university, first class psychology possibly, or history of religion, whatever it might be, they'll tell you the Old Testament is Hebrew folklore, uh, the New Testament's Greek mythology, it's filled with mistakes, all cultures have those crazy beliefs in some way, shape, or form, and they will sell you a bill of goods. They won't tell you that the Bible is the greatest evidence or documentation for any man that ever lived. By the way, this is not just one testimony. If you go to Matthew, you have one singular testimony that speaks of many different events that happened in the life of Jesus Christ. And by the rules of, of historical uh, research and investigation, we find that these Gospels were written down. I don't really want to get on the apologetic side here this morning, but they were written well within the realm of, of the time that Jesus Christ died. And, and by the way, there is not one contradiction in any of them, but these are the things that you're going to hear. So then you're going to have an influence. You're trying to get them to see Jesus loves them. You're praying the Holy Spirit will convict them and the world's trying to pull them away from Jesus. Well, as Pilate was pondering this, his influences began to work. A supernatural heavenly influence and a devilish wicked and worldly influence. How many ever saw, you know, cartoons years ago, maybe Tom and Jerry, and they'd have like, here pop up an angel on one shoulder, and they'd have the devil pop up on the other shoulder. The devil would be like, no, man, don't do that. You know, do this terrible thing. And the angel would be like, oh, no, please. You know, all that. And, so there's, and by the way, that's not that far-fetched. Because that is really, there is a spiritual battle in the life of everyone. God is drawing people and trying to put his message in their heart and bring Christians by them. And yet the devil is doing everything he can to keep people blinded. Now what this pictures here where Pilate begins to be in this valley of decision, it pictures a sinner torn over whether they should come to Christ. Now I want to examine both of these influences quickly because I think they're important. Number one. The supernatural heavenly influence came in the form of a wife troubled by God in a dream. Now get this. Pilate is ready to make his decision. The only problem is the day he's going to make his decision, something really odd happens the night before, and that is his wife has this dream. And in this dream, she hears just as clear as a bell to the point where she runs to her husband and stops everything and whispers in his ear and says, Hey! Don't have anything to do with this guy. Last night in a dream, I, uh, something, something dealt with me and said, this guy's innocent. You should have nothing to do with having him put to death. And so I'm sure this must have struck a vein, you know, struck a foul string in, in the soul of Pilate because he's already knowing the man's innocent. He's already legally declared him to be innocent. Even under threat of his own death, under Herod, he does that. And so he knows the guy is innocent. And now his wife comes and says, I have this dream. And, uh, you know, this wasn't one of those deals where a man ate too much pepperoni pizza, you know, went to bed and had a vision or anything. This was actually God working in this man's heart. Now, listen, notice Matthew 27, verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And so she has a dream. God's dealing with her. And so what is this? I believe it's God giving him a chance. This is God showing him that what he's about to do is the wrong thing. Now let me just say, when God places you in the valley of decision, uh, God many times graciously, supernaturally draws you with conviction. And I remember I was in the valley of decision. All of a sudden a brother gets saved. It's like, wow, can't deny that. This guy went from carousing, fighting, selling drugs. All of a sudden, he's going to church and telling me I need it as well. It's amazing how when you're in that valley of decision, God will send convictions upon you. 
Then my mother got saved. I've told this story before. When my mother got saved, I mean, things changed around the house. I think it was the very next day I went to get my cigarette pack and all my cigarettes were in the trash. There's gospel tracks uh, stuffed down in my cigarette package. And I'd open the underwear drawer, man, there'd be a Bible on top. I mean, mom was relentless, amen. God was sending convictions upon me and people to talk to me when I was in that valley of decision. Listen, if you've never been saved and you've got a friend that's saved, that's God working on your heart. You've got a spouse, if you've got a mother, father, children, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, and you've never been born again, I believe if they're saved, God is using them to try to draw you to himself so that you will be saved by the grace of God. And so we know that there's this good influence on Pilate. However, he had another influence in the form of the voices of the world. Now he said, I thought you said the devil was the other influence. Well, listen, the world speaks for the devil in many cases and doesn't even realize it. They're saying exactly what he wants them to say, although maybe subconscious or unconscious at times, they just don't realize exactly what they're doing. But notice Matthew chapter 27, if you'll turn there with me quickly. Matthew chapter number 27. So he's on the judgment seat and he's got this tumult going on. He's got a divided heart. Matthew 27. His wife's told him this. He's already troubled. He knows the guy's innocent. But then all of a sudden, the world starts tugging at him. Uh, Let me just tell you, the world is an albatross. It is a massive boulder. The devil will hang around your neck and drag you down to the lowest hell. Uh, with no regard, no care, wanting only your destruction. You listen to the world, friend, and I promise you, you will pay a price. You will wish to God you'd listen to the word of God someday. You'll look back and say, oh, I'm telling you, folks, that hell is filled with people that would give their right arm to be taken up out of the flames of hell. They'd give their eyeballs and every member of their body. If somebody would bring them up out of hell, sit them on a pew, give them another chance to come forward in a church service and cry out to God for salvation. If somebody could put them on an old-fashioned altar and let them repent, my friend, every, if we could take a man out of hell, and stand him in this pulpit. You think I get loud? You think I get serious? You think that I stomp and spit a little bit? Can you imagine someone coming up out of the flames of hell? How they would plead and how they would beg and how they would jump up and down and say, please listen to me. You must be saved. You do not want to go to the horrible place that I'm going. That's right. Right. Listen, the world's going to try to yank you straight to hell. Right. And on the authority of this book, I'm telling you, if you do not get saved, that is where you will go. Right. Matthew chapter 27, verse 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? The Bible said, They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? Now he's really troubled. You can see it. The, 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 the divided heart he's got. I know he's innocent. My wife tells me about this dream. I just don't feel good about this, guys. But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. He said, well, I'm glad he did that. Well, listen, not good enough. Man. Nope. I, I, that's not going to fix the problem. That is not going to get the blood of Jesus Christ off of his hands or off of anyone's hands. The whole world is guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. Whether you like it or not, it was the sin of every man, woman, boy, and girl that he took on his back when he died on the cross of Calvary. And everyone stands guilty before God Almighty. Not good enough. Why not? Well, he could have stopped the whole thing. He did not go far enough. He had the authority to release Jesus Christ. Pilate chose what many have called the middle road. Everybody's comfy on the middle road. But you, let me just say, there is really no middle road. It's, it's fictitious. It's a fallacy. And this idea that, well, I'm not going to make them mad. You know, they're really angry. I'm not going to make that, that mad over there. I'm just going to stay here in the middle. And as I've told you before, there's a bunch of dead possums and skunk and guts and stuff like that. That's what's Amen. in the middle of the road. Amen? Squashed caterpillars and iguanas and everything else. Amen? You are either for Jesus or you're against Jesus. What are you talking about? You can't kick the can down the road hoping that some way it will disappear forever because it will not disappear forever. And every man, woman, boy, and girl will be held accountable for the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So why did Pilate do this? Well, notice the strength and power of the pull of the world. Go to Mark chapter 15 with me. And I think it's really shown greatly in this account this historical account 
Mark chapter 15, verse 15. Can I tell you what? I've got friends and they're good friends. I, I, I used to have some friends I thought were friends. Here's many times the problem is, well, what will my friends think? Well, I'm going to tell you what, you better start worrying about what God thinks. Right. And when you start worrying about what God thinks, God will choose your friends for you. Right. If they can't stand you and hate, they hate you and they oppose you and oppose your Savior right. and oppose your Christianity, then, then that's on them. I mean, there's natural divisions that take place. And it's a great day in your life when you realize that. When you realize that you cannot live for the approval of man. Right. You have to be your own person. You, every one of us must give account of himself to God, all right? Your friends are not going to be there, uh, you know, to make reasons why you shouldn't get into heaven and how good a person you are, yeah. but ultimately you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. So listen, we've got to make sure that we're not letting the world pull us away from God. Notice Mark chapter 15, verse 15. The Bible said, and so Pilate, watch this, willing to content the people, release Barabbas. So not Jesus, release Barabbas. He wanted to content the people. I'm just going to make this crowd happy. So you're going to make them happy, and then that's going to be the decision for your life. You let them make that for you. Mm -hmm. No, it shouldn't work that way. And the Bible said, and deliver Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Uh-oh, now his hands are double bloody. Yep. The scourging, the Bible said it was put uh, uh, to Pilate's account that he was the one that had done this. But I'm going to tell you what. Somebody said this years ago, uh, an old man of God, and I thought this was great, and, and it never left me. He said, there's a difference between God and man. You know what it is? God can be pleased. Man. You'll never, you live, oh, I'm just going to make them happy. I know they're getting, you're never going to be able to please man. And as soon as you get to the point, you've done everything they wanted you to do to the point where you've even violated your own principles and you're acting like somebody that you're not, you're not being true to yourself man. and true to the word of God, then they're going to change the list and it's never going to end. Stop trying to please people. Man. That life is short. There's a heaven. There's a hell. There's an eternity. There's a Christ that died for you. Do what the Bible says. Do what's right. Not what people want. Amen. That's easier for you to say. Well, it ought to be easier for you to say if you love Jesus. I mean, listen, just look. Your soul's at stake. It ought to be something where, man, I'm going to go to hell. How can I? Because here's what people do. Well, what will mama think if I get saved? Well, mama's going to hell then too probably if she's going to be mad at you. So number one, you need to get saved. Then you need to go tell mama how to get saved. Amen? Well, you know, I've got this friend and we always get together and drink. Well, this would be a great opportunity to tell him I don't drink anymore because I got saved. you know why? Because if he goes to hell and you never tell him, now you're in trouble with God. So you need to get saved and, and stop thinking about what the world is saying. Amen? Hallelujah. I know I'm supposed to preach Christmas, Christmas you know, cupcakes today. Amen? Stop trying to please people. Why did he do it? Well, Luke 23, verse 23. And let me just read this to you. Well, let's go over there. Luke chapter 23. We're in Mark. And by the way, I'm so thankful that, again, this is not just in one historical book. But it is in different records. Luke chapter 23, verse number 23. And here's, here's the sad fact. If you don't start taking a stand for truth and doing what God wants you to do and following His Holy Spirit in your life, verse 23, and they were instant with loud voices requiring that He might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevail. So people's lives are being run and run straight into the lake of fire and ruined because they heeded the voices of somebody outside of the Holy Spirit's voice and the word of Almighty God. And verse uh, chapter number, uh, 23, verse 24. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be requi as they required. Now what's the big deal? Well, as a result of Pilate's one decision that day, an innocent man would die on a cross. When asked the question, what will you do with Jesus of Nazareth? He basically, if you look at all of the information and summarize it, his idea was simply this. Yeah, I have kind feelings towards him. I don't think he really did anything wrong, but I'm not going to commit my life and my livelihood to his release. It's not worth it. I'm not willing to pay a price to make sure I do the right thing in reference to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, you say, well, isn't there a price to be paid if you get saved? Yes, there is. I'm not going to lie to you. God's going to want to change your life. 
And he'll give you the strength to, to he'll change it for you. You don't have to do it. Amen. And yes, there's going to be some things that God says, thou shalt not. And he's going to expect you to obey that. And some things the Lord says, thou shalt. And he's going to expect you to obey that. But you better weigh all that out. But I'm just telling you, folks, I wouldn't go to hell for anything that God might want me to do or anything that God might want to keep me from. You don't understand, folks. We are talking about an eternity in the lake of fire. I, I like Jesus, you know. I will commend Pilate in one area. He did count the cost. Sadly, the sum was too high for him. No, I don't want to have to pay that much for Jesus. You care about what people think and all of that. So Christ died on Calvary soon after. And the question I have today as we close our thoughts on this brief look at this man, Pilate. Whatever happened to Pilate? How did it all end? Pilate was ultimately sent to Rome. Of course, we know that Christ went to the cross and died for our sins. But Pilate was sent to Rome to face charges, ironically, of unnecessary cruelty in his rule. So yeah, that, that just there's a lot to that, amen? But historians Josephus and Eusebius both recorded that he spent his final days exiled to the Italian mountains where one day in A.D. 38, he walked into Lake Lucerne and drowned himself. One historian said, wringing his hands and stating, I can't get his blood off of my hands, and killed himself there in Lake Lucerne. Pilate is most likely burning in the flames of hell as I speak this morning. And I will tell you this, friend, you can't get his blood off of your hands. That's right. Every single day that you live another day without Jesus is another day that you risk having to stand before God as a sinner and for hear, to hear him say, depart from me, a curse, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So Pilate was this man in the valley of decision and be reminded that the wrong decision in the valley of decision could bring you and will bring you eternal sorrow. Stop listening to the devil. Stop listening to the world. I remember counting all that and thinking, what will my friends think and all of that? And then there came a day where it was like conviction overwhelming. I said, you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks. I've got to do the right thing with my life. Right. God created me. He gave me breath. He gave me life. And what I must do is give my life back to him and let him save me and be his servant for all of my days. And I pray that that's a decision that you'll make today. Father, I want to thank you, God, for just this little study on the life of Pilate. Lord, it's, it's amazing how we look at this and we see an unjust trial. And yet, as we read Romans 8, 28, you work all things together for good. Because it was through these circumstances that you led your dear son 